greetings to Kentucky Association board meeting. Um, I'm excited. I bring you um, warm greetings from Atlanta, from the regional office. And as John mentioned that, yes, I am very new. We were counting it up just, I think, last week. Because, you know, when the holidays come around, they kind of throw you off, right? So you're like, okay, was it last week or was it yesterday? I don't know. But we were counting it up and they were like, well, how long have you been here? And I said, wow, this coming Friday will be four whole months. And it feels like it has been um, an eternity already. Uh, but I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the opportunity. Um, um, I always like to tell people just a little bit about myself, but I know that you guys read a lot of information, but um, I would say that I always say that I kind of grew up in um, in Head Start in in Ohio, and so my um, my experience was with Region Five because of the Chicago office. Um, so I have just about done every aspect um, of Head Start that you can just about imagine. I started out as a home based manager, so that was my first love, and then I moved on to childcare partnerships where I actually had over 30 some child care partnership centers um, in, from the beginning, from the inception of it, where it, if people think it's a confusing now, it was completely confusing then. So um, we were just you know, hitting the ground running with that. And then I moved on to an associate director. And then we had like a, it was, no, I think it was a district director where we had quads. Um, and this was in Columbus, Ohio. And we had quads where it was four of us and all of us took like four parts of, of our service area and divided it up. And so at that time I had, I was responsible for about 1200 families from beginning to end. And that's how we did the quads. And then from there, I moved on to um, become a head, my first, because all the rest of them were associate director or assistant director or something like that. And then I finally moved on to become my first Head Start director um, in Columbus, Ohio. And then I took a position in Canton, Ohio as the Head Start director. And then I went to the school district. Um, I always tell people, I, um, I, I, I'm not going to say I had enough at that point of Head Start, but I'm going to say is that um, I had always heard and in, in Kentucky, you guys didn't have this issue. You don't have this issue, never had this issue. But it was always this huge divide between um, school district employees versus Head Start employees and who would bring, bring the better quality, right? There was just, it has always been that since the inception. And so I really wanted that opportunity to figure it out, you know, so I had a chance to become the early Head Start coordinator at this particular school district. So I took that. And um, what I walked away with from there is, is that um, if you have the passion, no matter whether you're school district or whether you're Head Start, um, then you're a winner. And so, it, you know, but if the passion is not there, I don't care where, you know, which segment it is, it's not going to work. So then that was that. And then, um, then I moved to Atlanta and I actually worked in a program. And then I just left um, working um, for the state of Georgia when I actually came over here to be the um, regional program manager. So just to give you guys a little background, I always talk about anytime I get an opportunity to have a crowd is that I love to think about things in an excellent manner. And so I really like to think about always moving in that direction. And so whether I will always get there or not, that is, um, <clears throat> that is insignificant. The goal is, is that we're always going to push towards um, doing excellent work for children and families. And so we might fall a little short, but we're never going to fall short of the goal. And so that's what that's where we go. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys at this point. And the information that I'm going to share with you actually is, um, I can't remember which meeting it was at, but if, if you miss one of the Head Start Forward meetings, it doesn't matter because I'm going to share a lot of that information with you right now. But um, also is on um, eClick, which is another debate, whether it's eClick, eClick, or however we want to call it. Um, it's one or the other. We all know what we're talking about. And we always say, depending on what region you're from. So if you're from north, like if you're probably from northern Kentucky, you might refer to it as closer to what the people in Ohio would say. And they usually say eClick. But if you're southern Kentucky, you probably refer to it as eClick. Um, and it's the same way with Ursi, Ursia, and it's, it's the same way with that, depending on where you're from, how you actually pronounce it. 
of course, we would say um, Ursia because we want to hear the A because a lot of times people take that attendance and they don't do a lot with it. So we always want to make sure we put it in there. But needless to say, um, this is where we are. I'm going to change the way the screen looks and make it full screen. Can you guys see that? We're good? OK. Uh, <clears throat> wanted to just share a few things with you because I think it's important for us to let me make sure I get look let me make sure I get my arrows together on how to move my screen along going too fast I got it now yep there we go so um during this small presentation and I'm going to cut through the chase I'm probably not going to uh, read everything but I'm going to give you all of the essence of it but during this actual presentation I am, um, we will address a course because this is on everybody's mind. I don't care where you live at this point, it's on your mind. Uh, we will address COVID-19 activities, guidance and regulations from the perspective of the Office of Head Start in Region 4. Um, particularly, we're gonna address the public health safety, COVID-19 vaccines, masks for in-person services, oral health services, that's another biggie. Um, family style meals, transportation safety, and home visits. And then hopefully there's a few minutes left for, um, for some questions um, that you guys may have. I am going to change my screen so that I can actually, there we go, um, be able to see everything. Okay, a public health um, emergency still exists. I know um, in, in our region in particular, this is really not a question because being um, in region four, which covers eight of the southern regions, we know that every day our numbers are rising um, higher than some other states. And so with that said, we know for a fact that the public health emergency is still in existing. And then how do we waiver, how do we um, move through it and how do we provide? So with that public health emergency, um, what is the status of the public health emergency? So the public health, original public health emergency went into effect January 27th, 2020. Since then, um, it remains in effect um, since uh, it was, it was, it remains in effect um, for 90 days and can be extended. So it has been extended. So the new effective date is July 20th, 2021. So with that said, that yes, it is still there, um, and it is critical that we actually adhere to it um, because we keep hearing the numbers increasing and increasing and increasing, and we want to just make sure that, um, that everyone is safe. I, I come from the standpoint, I want to make sure that families are safe. I want to make sure that our staff, that the staff is safe and that, you know, um, that they're not vulnerable to things and that they're not taking things home to their families because they're just as important as everyone. So we wanna make sure that everyone is safe with that. Um, um, will the Office of Head Start require the staff, um, the Head Start grantees uh, get the COVID vaccine? I'm gonna answer this one from this one. Um, basically the decision to require vaccine remains a program and an employer um, Pacific decision. It, you know, it's just that it's a decision that the federal government, we cannot make um, any type of recommendations for that at this point, even though your funding is um, federally, it is federal funding, it is still, you are still, as they would say, a private entity. And so there's still the laws that you would, you know, that you would have to think about. But one of the things that we, that, that I will leave with you with this particular slide is, um, you want to make sure that um, that you look at whatever your state and local guidance are around around this particular topic. And one of the things that I that I really want to uh, want to stress is that um, is that you really really consider um, looking into whatever the laws, your state guidance around making um, making those decisions for your program. Uh, private entities have done it across the country. Private entities are doing it right now. Um, if you if you do, just make sure that you develop a policy and procedure, um, which is what Head Start lives and breathes on. As we all know, a policy and procedure 
um, so that later on after COVID passed and then we start having our reviews, which we're gonna start, hope to start having in-person reviews again in January of 2022. So after that, if, if it's ever questioned, as long as there are policy and procedure that went into effect, then you guys are safe um, from a Head Start standpoint. But just know that we can't make any mandates um, or require any of those things at this point, um, although you're receiving federal dollars. Okay. Next slide. I'm gonna make sure that I have my, um, okay, my next slide. Um, Mass for in-person services. So we know that Head Start Definitely the Office of Head Start want us to start getting back to in-person services. And so I say that from the standpoint, before I talk about masks, is, um, I wanna spend just a minute with that. And just to say that whatever your particular um, uh, health department, whatever your HACEC committees are, are, are suggesting, whatever your local and federal um, laws are suggesting is where we want you to go. Of course, we have already said that we want everyone to get back to in-person services um, for this particular school year, but if there are some COVID outbreaks in your community, then follow that. Follow your community um, resources and the powers that be in the community. As much as we say do X, Y, and Z, we do know that community um, health is most important and that you follow those, those regulations. So in-person mask, um, Head Start programs uh, should make sure that they uh, should make mask universal requirements for adults and children age two and older. This is where the Office of Head Start is, 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 is saying, and this is the direction that we would like. And it is just for the various reasons. And the reasons are, um, we know that there are no vaccines um, are currently available for young children. And one of the things I wanna say with this one, especially as we hear all of the statistics and, and look at everything across the board, we know that the Delta variants, um, for whatever reason, is favoring the younger population, is favoring children more so than the original um, COVID-19 variants when it was out um, last year, when it's out last year and even right now, but we know that the Delta variants that is, um, is really, really focusing in, in most cases, on the younger population. So since we know that there are no vaccines for children under 12, then we want to make sure that, that, you know, that we protect that population as much as possible, our, you know, the most vulnerable population, of course. And then the other reason, we want to make sure that adults are modeling. Um, it is important for teachers uh, for teaching children healthy habits, such as, you know, wearing masks. And then this is my own personal note here is that, um, is that is, and I think we're going to mention this a little further down in one of the other slides, is that is, that is being worn the appropriate way. And that is, you know, for nose and mouth and not, nose and mouth and not having the mouth, not having the nose exposed. And I know that that is probably the most comfortable way of wearing it, but it's not the most safe, it's not the safest way to wear it. So um, wanted to just make sure that I highlighted that as well, that it's critical that we, that we model um, what we want. And then, you know, of course we know that the virus continues to spread, right? Especially in communities um, with low vaccination rates. Um, and, but one of the things that, I, that we're seeing in region four in all eight states is that it's just on, a, it's just on an increase um, in the majority of, of, of this region. So if I look at Alabama, if I look at Mississippi, if I look at you know, a lot of the states that it is just really growing and growing and we, and we have to get that information so that we can think about um, whether or not there are some uh, changes that we need to make on the national level or some regional changes that we need to implement, uh, but we just see that it is just expanding. And so um, I say that to say, uh, make sure that we're all careful and that people are adhering to them, especially while they're in groups. Oral health and hygiene. Um, last year, toothbrushing was suspended. Um, I remember when I, uh, I think I was still at the state at that, at that point with the program. And when that was one of the things that was, everyone was so nervous about, and they were just so concerned 
about um, the oral health and whether or not they were going to be out of compliance, you know, for not providing it. So we were all, it was a sigh of relief when the Office of Head Start actually decided to, um, to suspend it um, for the 20, uh, 2020-21 school year, program year. So um, now, one of the things that they're saying is that, um, is that, you know, I, I'll just go and look at it. So it says programs should continue to promote um, effective oral health hygiene, hygiene, excuse me, for all children receiving services. Toothbrushing is in, um, in group care setting may resume if the program can implement strategies to reduce the possibility of transmitting the virus to other. And then um, basically here, when we're thinking about this particular group, we're looking at the salivary, uh, salivary, salivary droppings during brushing. But the thing that I wanna leave with you is that it is recommended that program staff help children with brushing um, be fully vaccinated against, uh, against COVID-19. Um, and wearing appropriately fitted mask cover, uh, covering their nose and mouth for additional protection. So the recommendation here is that we definitely continue because um, it's no longer suspended, that we um, negate the oral health, um, toothbrushing in particular. So with that, but the recommendation is, is that your staff that are going to assist children in brushing their teeth is that they are um, fully vaccinated uh, against COVID-19. And then of course, still wearing the mask, right? And the fitted mask. So if you, if you don't take away anything else, we know that they have lifted the suspension and we know that um, what the recommendation is. And so um, it goes back to that question that we talked about earlier, whether or not you can mandate people um, having their vax, you know, having being, vax, being vaccinated. Um, you can't necessarily do that, but the recommendation is, is that if we want to keep people as safe as possible, then um, while utilizing, while brushing teeth and being careful with that, making sure that the person that is assisting children has been vaccinated. Okay. So move on to the next one. Family style meals. This is another one that was a little bit um, concerning to people. Um, last year probably is still, um, I think as I look at other, um, at other communities and I look at everyone, I think that we've done relatively well with this one, but there's still some fear out there, which I understand. Um, is, um, is there new guidance around family style meal, meals? Here it says the CDC guidance say that they are at very low risk of transmission from food food packaging, surfaces, and shared objects. And the shared objects come in because um, if we're looking at um, family style meals and we go back to the way that they were where the child would actually service, serve themselves, then that's why they wanted to make sure that, that we talked about the shared objects because a lot of times it's handling those spoons, handling the, um, the pitcher, and moving the actual dishes around, people have been so nervous about that. And I get it, I get it. But based on the information that we have, the transmission of these things are very low. Um, and, and I guess they can't say that that is, that is no risk at all. We just know that is a very low risk. However, the recommendation in here is um, seating, children's, uh, seating children further apart and providing as much fresh air as possible. And I know we all know that it's fall in Kentucky, right? And so, especially for Northern Kentucky, in a minute by October, late, no, early November, it's gonna start, the winds are gonna get brisk and it's gonna be a little cooler. However, that is one of the recommendations that they're saying, seating children further apart and providing as much fresh air as possible um, are parts, um, possible are parts of a layered approach to protecting children. Keep masks on until children and adults are eating. Um, staff should ensure children. This is this is where this is really the 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 biggie here is staff should ensure ensure children wash wash their hands prior to and immediately after. And we all know that if you've been in Head Start any time at all, and we've done family style 
um, meals before, we made sure that before coming to the table, we had the um, hand washing time frames where we would probably be doing an activity and then you're calling them over, sending them to the table. The part that we might have done and we might not have done consistently is um, ensuring that immediately hands are washed um, after, after any meals. And so with that said, it is critical that we take that away, um, that, that we take that away. So if we haven't been doing that, that's one of the things that we wanna make sure that we start to do um, even more frequently because it's critical. That is probably one of the, the bigger things that will help us to not necessarily um, continue to trans, transmit. And of course, we're gonna put our mask and things back on at, immediately after eating, but the hand washing um, is critical that we actually take that away as well. And then here, transportation safety. For me, um, and then I probably shouldn't give my own personal opinion on these, but this one feels really challenging, but I'm sure that um, someone that does transportation on a regular basis or have you have policies, procedures that you have adapted to this that would allow you to actually um, do it in this fashion. Um, how can programs support transportation safety? Programs should continue to position children as far apart as possible. We know that um, with one child, um, with one child per bench, and children not seated um, seated in consecutive rows. If this is a possibility, um, then def definitely. Then they talk about children um, from the same uh, from the same home. They sit together, which we all know that they have um, that that is possible. Then it says um, the vehicle operator and bus monitor should practice all safe uh, all safety actions and protocols as indicated for all program staff, including the use of masks and, ha and hand hygiene. Um, weather permitting, this is where it's really, it's, it's okay for it now, maybe in some cases, because I think most people probably might still have the air on um, as they're transporting, but um, um, weather permitting, open windows on buses to include, um, to increase ventilation on the buses. And so I say that to say later on, that's gonna be more challenging. So hopefully things will start, we'll see a turn for, um, you know, where we'll start seeing numbers drop again. But at this point, we know across region four, the numbers are, um, are growing and growing. But again, um, keeping the windows open as much as possible to increase the ventilation will help in, um, in transportation and transporting children back um, to and from the program. And then my last slide before we get into questions and answers is um, home visitor, home visits. And I know that this right here is a huge one for um, rural communities. So with that said, um, how can programs support home visits? Uh, how can programs support safe home visits? When we're looking at safe home visits, um, this one right here is, um, is really important for us to think about. Um, before entering a home, home visits and other Head Start staff who make home visits should first assess their own risk. And again, I, I think I mentioned this earlier that um, our staff is critical. That our staff is just as important as everyone else. Um, I remember um, in my early years of Head Start, it seemed like we were always focusing in on the families. And one of the things that I always made sure that in in whatever leadership role I had, that we were always focusing in on everyone, all inclusive, because our our staff is equally as important um, in order for the parents and the families to have a a successful. Um, Head Start program or early Head Start, then we wanted to make sure that our staff was, you know, equally important. So we want you to assess, assess their own risk of transmitting infection or risk of complications. That is critical. We want to make sure that you really think about your own health um, if they get, you know, if they get infected. Then the other aspect is, is that we, um, they should also identify family members in the visit home and the visit at home who may be at, at, great, at a great risk of transmitting the disease or having complications um, if infected with COVID-19. 
um, home visiting program should contact families prior to the home visit um, and ask about the following. And this right here, one and two is really important. And these are the questions that I don't care where you go, just about it, with any services. I went to have my um, eye exam and they asked me these questions. Um, signs of symptoms or um, of a respiratory infection, such as fever, you know, subjective or um, confirmed of 104 or higher, coughing, sore throat, soreness, or a breath, um, shortness of breath. All of these things are being asked on a constant basis. And, and even for your home visitors, these are the things that we want them to know ahead of time. And if that is happening, then we want, you know, we want to make sure that they don't participate. Um, contact with anyone. I just had this question. I can't remember where, but I just had this question. Contact with anyone with COVID. Oh, because I did a COVID um, test about a week and a half ago, and that was the first thing. And a lot of times you really don't know, because a lot of times people really don't know if they have it or not, because you can actually just be a, a carrier with zero symptoms. And so you really don't know. I mean, we know that if we knew someone and they told us, then yes, that will be, we can actually talk about that. But a lot of times you may come in contact with someone and they're not even aware that they have it because they can have, they could just be a carrier and show no symptoms. Um, known exposure to someone with, you know, suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Um, with all of these things, one of the things that we really want you to want you to know is that um, to please just ask these questions, protect your staff, maybe face-to-face -face visits. Um, if some of these things are happening in some of your family homes, it's not what you can do at this point. Um, but think about other means. I know during the as we can say, the heat of the pandemic, we actually were able to do home visits differently. And so if there is um, a risk to your staff going in, taking it back to their staff, then you want to prevent, you know, you want to guard against that. If it's a risk of your um, staff going into someone's home and taking it to the home, then we want to prevent against that. So um, for home visiting, um, and particularly in rural areas, um, you really want to think about um, other opportunities in the event that um, you can't really go into that home or your home visitor is not um, well enough to go to that home. Or if they have young children in their home, there's a lot to take into consideration. So I really wanted to just flush that out because it's really important um, for you to think about all aspects of what, can, um, what we can do regarding home visits. So I believe that um, this is my last uh, slide. Um, and we can actually, I wanna make sure that I didn't leave anything out. Okay, I didn't necessarily leave anything out. So I want to move on to questions and answer at this point and see if there's anyone that have any questions, any, um, anything that I can entertain and answering, and I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can actually just um, look directly at everyone while we're communicating. I think I see a hand already. I think Jessica. Yes, how are you doing? I am well, thank <laughs> you. Great, so I have a question about, um, as you know, or may not know, um, the numbers in Kentucky are steadily rising. Um, we have seen so many classrooms that we have had to shut over the past probably just two weeks. Um, I'm wondering, will there be any provisions or have there been any conversations at the regional office about um, ha having waivers for some of those 45-day documents or requirements? Um, just because we'll open a classroom and shut a classroom and our 45 days is just about up. So I was wondering, have there been provisions or could we submit a waiver for um, some of those items? Thank you. Really good question. Um, at this point, there has not been any discussion about a waiver because what we are allowing programs to do is um, because, believe it or not, Jessica, you're not unique. Um, there are so many communities where, um, and again, pretty much region four, most of our programs start um, classes even as late as early as the last week in July 
to the first week in August, right? So we know that if we look at it from that standpoint, today is September 8th, we know for a fact that people, um, that most people are getting close to that 30 to 45 days, you know, you might be 15 days away from it. So what we're saying to everyone is, again, like everything that I mentioned, it, you know, pretty much opening back up, coming back in um, person to person, uh, providing home base, providing um, family style meals, provide brush tooth brushing, all of those things are predicated upon whether or not where you are in your community. So for an example, like you're saying, um, everyone is actually, they've opened up classes, they've already started, they had to close um, a couple, a couple of them had to close a couple centers, right? Because it was rampant there. And so they closed the whole center. What we're saying is that basically what we would need is just your documentation that you ended up opening on time, had to, you know, had an outbreak in one of your locations, had to close, something came up. If you can document that um, as, as anyone has been in Head Start for more than 24 hours, we all know, right? Documentation is the key to everything. So if you can actually document your outbreaks and the things that hindered you, then you're not going to be out of compliance. But at this particular time, there has not been anything that, that has come down to say that we are allowing waivers on it. So, you know, that may be forthcoming because again, as we can see, it is just, um, I don't care what state I talk to, it is just um, growing and growing and growing, um, even to the point to where we're all like, oh my goodness, it feels like we're you know, getting ready to go back into something that we don't want to, right? So with that said, um, I wouldn't panic about your 45 days. I would actually just document um, everything and, 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 we'll be, and you'll be fine. Just document it, that's it. This I hope is, that helps. I hope oh, that sorry. helps. <clears throat> Does the same thing apply to your full enrollment expectations? Because we lost 2% of our enrollment when the mask mandate came out for children in this age group. So um, right now, um, we know that the mandate for in full enrollment is, is that we're moving towards that, right? Um, as of January of 2022 is when um, full enrollment, the, the full enrollment um, protocols will be back in place that you must have it and you can't be under, um, you know, for four months in a row, right? We know that that doesn't officially start until January. And that is where we are today. If this thing continues to grow like we see it, you know, then perhaps there's going to be some other um, mandates coming down or some relaxing of those of that January date. But we can't predict that in September. We just have to see how it's going to play out. So right now, we know that you want to continue moving towards your goal of, of full enrollment. You're not going to be um, you're not going to be out of compliance if, you know, if the month of September is not fully enrolled because we know that people are still struggling. And we're not going to start counting those things again to the, to the degree of the actual standard, right? You know, of the regulations that's in place until January, 2022. Um, but then that's September, we're talking on the 8th. Who knows what's gonna happen by September 30th? <laughs> in all honesty, you know, there may be something that we might be quickly putting together to send out if this thing continues down the road that it is. But right now, the, those are the rules that um, you're moving towards full enrollment. You haven't reached it, you know, yet, and you're not going to be out of compliance um, if you can show the documentation, right? Because we know that we live on documentation. So if we can show the documentation of where we are and the things that have happened to hinder, then you'll be fine. But again, um, what we're saying by January of 2022 is where we're going to start, you know, um, adhering to the, the policy, the, to the actual standards, again, where full enrollment is required. And that is in September, that's what we're saying. We'll see how that plays out in January. Then I hope that helped, Rachel. Yes, it did, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, thank you. Other questions, thoughts, concerns? As people are thinking about other things to, um, to ask me, um, I just want to say, stay safe. As, you know, be careful. Um, love on people at a distance. <laughs> Protect yourself. 
um, the older I get, the more I tell everybody it's really critical that, you know, when I was younger, of course, I thought I was invincible right now that I I've turned some corners here. It is imperative that we actually just um, think about the, you know, think about even taking home, taking things home to people that you love. You want to be careful even going home with your families. Again, for whatever reason, the Delta variant is really favoring the younger population and the, the you know, even the elementary children. I mean, I have schools um, in the Mississippi area that opened the last week in July and they have been closed for the last three weeks. Uh, so, and we have a new program that they were trying to figure out how to get open in that time frame. It's not happening. It's not happening because, not because of, you know, other things like licensing, it's because of the actual Delta variants, so. so could, I, could I ask one question? Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we know that there's a, there is a history of federal dollars that flow to states are often used as a carrot to get states to adopt specific standards or specific mandates. Mm -hmm. Given that Head Start, though, is not money that flows to states, it's money that flows specifically to grantees. Mm -hmm. Could you ever envision a period given that we have the Biden administration on one end of the spectrum and many, many states and governors and legislatures on the other end of the spectrum? Could you ever envision a world in which, despite the fact that we want Head Start programs to abide by local and state standards and guidance, that that guidance just isn't good enough? And that Head Start simply has to finally one day say, if you're gonna be spending federal dollars, you need to do A, B, and C? Mm -hmm. Um, you know what, that's a really good question. I don't, you know what, um, it was, it's really funny that you would ask that question because about a month ago, I had a similar question from another, um, I think it was another state association actually, that was connected to, in some kind of way, it was through the state and, and it was, they were asking a very similar question. And the answer is, is that I think that these things have been tried for, the last 20 years. And we're still where we are right now. Um, because there's, you know, on one hand, people say that if you send um, the, this, this particular federal dollar to the state, a lot of times it could get lost in the school districts. I mean, I don't, that's not, I'm, I'm not saying that that's true or false. I'm just telling you what some of the people are saying. Um, a lot of times they're saying that, you know, it's better for it to continue in the direction that it is. Um, it has been advocation on both sides. Whether or not it will ever get to to that to that bridge is is up for you know for all of us that will be here long enough to to see it turn that corner. Um, what I think what they tried to do some years back when they actually put the collab directors into various states so that um, and some of them work extremely well, and some of them are still trying to figure it out. But I, I really do believe that was the role, um, and only because I've worked with several co collab directors even before I got here, that was the role what, for them to inform or keep everybody together. Because um, think about it from this angle, that the actual, um, what is it, the child, um, oh, see the child welfare dollars go through the state and then that kind of comes around where the state utilizes that and then they can actually build the gap between the Head Start and that, and, but it's all federal dollars. So I really do believe that that was their first effort of trying to bid, bridge that gap when they actually put the collab directors. And again, some of them work extremely well and some of them are still trying to figure it out. But I think that is the, um, the bridge and if we can actually get those working better, then we might see some of the things that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for the state being involved when it comes to the funding or oversight yeah. or anything like that, because I think the way it's set up now is the way that it should work. I mean, you really Absolutely. need a direct relationship. Take the middleman out. You don't need that. Right. Uh, at the same time, though, I guess I'm more concerned about if a state is, you know, let's say we've got kids getting sicker and sicker. And we've got a state that is not introducing any mandates, any standards. They're saying, hey, you know, hey, we're not doing anything. Superintendents in your district, school boards not doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, is there ever that point where, you know, the administration steps in and just says, enough's enough. Right. If you're going to be spending federal dollars, you need to 
be doing, you need to be having this and that. So anyway, it's a speculative question. So we have John, a John, 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 I hope you and I both can, can get so, there. I hope we can both see that because it will be interesting to see yeah. um, to see it. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we will. Um, Cindy? Yeah, real quickly, I, I know there are not decisions or specific directives, but can you speak at all to conversations oh. about universal pre-K and or expansion opportunities for funding for either Head Start or Early Head Start? Yeah, it was a, it was a matter of fact, you want to hear something funny? funny? Um, that was going to be part of what I was going to talk about, the universal pre-K, but then we felt like th there wasn't enough time. So we were like, okay, everybody has COVID on their mind, right? I mean, that is like, what are we going to do with COVID? So we we chose COVID over, over that. But I can, there is, um, at one of the Head Start Forward meetings, it was one of the very early ones. I want to say like the May or early June meeting there. And I can even send this to John and he can get it to you. Um, I can send this out um, after my staff meeting um, this afternoon. I'll send that out and you'll see it. It really does talk a lot about universal pre-K in this administration and how the, the, the funding is going to start rolling out. Um, if, I, if it's not in this fiscal year, 2022. I believe it is though, but let me just get that. I'll get that to him and he can send it out to whomever he desires to. Um, it's, that is funny that you would ask that question because we were like, well, for sake of time, let's take this off because everybody's going to want to know about COVID. And you ask a question about universal pre-K. So I'll get it to him. Okay. Any other questions? Maria, this is Christy Lewis. I'm the Head Start um, Association President. I just want to thank you for your time today. We really appreciate you joining our great state of Kentucky, and um, we hope that uh, we'll be in person in the spring, mm -hmm. and um, maybe you can be in person with us to get our get our conference started off well, and um, you know see how the year is going. So I just appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And it, you know what, Christy, um, where you're positioned in my Zoom, you're like right in front of me and your actual head knobs were um, really affirming. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. 